Today I am called upon to honour a man whose name will be joined in the history of our movement with those of Bertrand Russell, Robert Ingersoll, Thomas Paine, David Hume. He's a writer and an orator with a matchless style commanding a vocabulary and a range of literary and historical allusion far wider than anybody I know. And I live in Oxford. <laughs> His alma mater and mine. He's a reader whose breadth of reading is simultaneously so deep and comprehensive as to deserve the slightly stuffy word learned. <laughs> Except that Christopher is the least stuffy learned person you will ever meet. He is a debater who will kick the stuffing out of a hapless victim, <laughs> yet he does it with a grace that disarms his opponent while simultaneously eviscerating him. <laughs> he is emphatically not of the all too common school that thinks the winner of a debate is he who shouts loudest. His opponents may shout and shriek, indeed they do, but Hitch doesn't need to shout. His words, his polymathic store of facts and allusions, his commanding generalship of the field of discourse, the fork lightning of his wit. I tried to sum it up in my review of God is Not Great in the Times of London. There is much fluttering in the dovecots of the deluded, and Christopher Hitchens is one of those responsible. Another is the philosopher A.C. Grayling. I shared a platform with both. We were to debate against a trio of, as it turned out, rather half-hearted religious apologists. Of course, I don't believe in a god with a long white beard, but I hadn't met Hitchens before, but I got an idea of what to expect when Grayling emailed me to discuss tactics. After proposing a couple of lines of attack for himself and me, he concluded, and Hitch will spray AK-47 ammo at the enemy <laughs> in characteristic style. Grayling's engaging caricature misses Hitchin's ability to temper his pugnacity with old-fashioned courtesy. And spray suggests a scattershot fusillade which underestimates the deadly accuracy of his marksmanship. <laughs> if you are a religious apologist invited to debate with Christopher Hitchens, decline. <laughs> his witty repartee, his ready access store of historical quotations, his bookish eloquence, his effortless flow of well-formed and beautifully spoken words would threaten your arguments even if you had good ones to deploy a string of reverends and theologians ruefully discovered this during Hitchens' barnstorming book tour around the United States. With characteristic effrontery, he took his tour through the Bible Belt states, the reptilian brain of Southern and Middle America, <laughs> rather than the easier pickings of the country's cerebral cortex to the north and down the coasts. The plaudits he received were all the more gratifying. Something is stirring in that great country. End of quote. Christopher Hitchens is known as a man of the left, except that he's too complex a thinker to be placed on a single left-right continuum. By the way, I've long been surprised that the very idea of a single left-right political spectrum works at all. Psychologists need many mathematical dimensions in order to locate the human personality. And why should political opinion be any different? With most people, it's surprising how much of the variance is explained by the single dimension we call left-right. If you know somebody's opinion on, say, the death penalty, you can usually guess their opinion on taxation or public health. But Christopher is a one-off. He is unclassifiable. He might be described as a contrarian, except that he has specifically and correctly disavowed the title. He's uniquely placed in his own multidimensional space. 
You don't know what he will say about anything until you hear him say it. And when he does, he will say it so well and back it up so fully that if you want to argue against him, you'd better be on your guard. We treasure his bon mots, and I'll just quote a few of my favorites. From the penetratingly logical, that which can be asserted without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. To the cuttingly witty, everybody does have a book in them, but in most cases, that's where it should stay. <laughs> To the courageously unconventional, Mother Teresa was not a friend of the poor. She was a friend of poverty. She said that suffering was a gift from God. She spent her life opposing the only known cure for poverty, which is the empowerment of women and the emancipation of them from a livestock version of compulsory reproduction. And this, everything about Christianity is contained in the pathetic image of the flock. <laughs> His respect for women and their rights shines forth. Who are your favorite heroines in real life? The women of Afghanistan, Iraq and Iran, who risk their lives and their beauty to defy the foulness of theocracy. I was asked to honor Christopher Hitchens today, I need hardly say that he does me the far greater honor by accepting this award in my name. Ladies and gentlemen, comrades, I give you Christopher Hitchens. Overwhelmed, uh, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, and I did promise Richard that if, if, I, if my voice didn't go to rags, I would try and speak to you a bit, if that's all right. In, in acknowledgement, but I do so acutely aware that I'm the one standing between you and the Saturday night fever <laughs> and the bars and the entertainments and so forth. And also we have a Q&A, we hope. So I'll be terse. As far as it lies within my power, I once got involved through no fault of my own in a presidential impeachment in Washington. But you may remember we had to learn a lot about a woman called Jennifer Flowers. Do you recall? Yes. Name spelled with a G. Bertrand, Bertrand Worcester, P.G. Woodhouse's great hero, said, always beware of women who spell gladdies with a W. Or Anything, any heedless of this, the president plunged on. In the, in the course of this, I had to discover about her that she'd once entered a Marilyn Monroe lookalike contest and had come forth. You may picture, therefore, comrades, my emotions of receiving not just the Richard Dawkins Prize, but the Richard Dawkins Prize from his own hands. It is true, however, that if we hadn't done it, someone was going to. Richard is sometimes accused, you've heard it, of being overstrident before my voice went. I sometimes got accused of it too. <laughs> it's, um, it's a bit more reasonable in my case. I'm a sort of street-fighting polemicist from way back. I ask for it and I get it and I can dish it out. Richard is the defender of a great discipline, a wonderful discipline, no, uh, biology. 
with revolutionary and transformative power in the way we think, in our attitudes to medicine, into our attitudes to our origins, and to finding out how beautiful and rare and wonderful, even miraculous, reality really is when we look it in the face. How should he not be strident to see his discipline being attacked and defamed, to see attempts being made to drive it out of the academy, to have the uh, pseudo-scientific garbage taught now under the rubric of equal time. In the old days, the fundamentalists, if they could ban something, did ban it, as the Scopes trial proved. Losing that battle, they decided to go for equal time and American way of fairness. Now they want it to be a sort of civil liberties and free speech issue. They've even got President Bush at one point to say, let's teach the debate. Well, by all means, let's teach the debate. But only in history class, or perhaps in civics. What we're not going to have is, well, boys and girls, I hope you enjoy the chemistry period. Be ready for alchemy when you come back after the break. <laughs> Up with this, up with this, we will not put. We're not going to have our children stultified and insulted by the teaching of garbage of this kind. And it seems to me an outrage that Richard has fewer friends in his profession. It's for them, I think, to rally and draw the sword and say, with our help too, that this nonsense uh, will not pass. Now, um, some of you know, well, I guess you all know now, that um, the words of one of my favorite poets, Ernest Dowson, are quite often with me. Um, Dowson stole them actually from the Roman poet Horace. Um, non sum qualis eram. I'm, I'm not as I was. Um, and though, as I know as well as you do, there's no point in arguing about the actual date or time of departure, because I like to think there would be no good time. I hope you agree with that. <laughs> uh, there, would, there would always be something that I urgently felt I ought to do or say. And one mustn't repine or give in to self-pity about that. But at this present moment, I have to say, I feel very envious of someone who's young and active and starting out in this argument. Just think of the extraordinary things that are happening to us. Go, for example, to the Smithsonian Museum, to the new, I hope you've done, done it, <coughs> to the new Hall of Human Origins. Magnificently curated new ex exhibition, which shows, among other things, the, the branch, or branches along which perhaps three, certainly three, maybe four if you count Indonesia, humanoid, shall we say, anthropoid species died out not very long ago, within measurable distance of 75,000 years or so, possibly destroyed by us, possibly not, we don't know. We know they decorated their graves. We think they probably had language ability. We don't know if they had souls. I'm sorry, I can't help you. <laughs> <laughs> We, we probably assume that they were deluded into having some kind of God. But no religion has yet pronounced on these cousins and brothers and sisters of ours because they don't fit. There's no way of fitting them into the ridiculous story that makes this tape rind, wind round and round again and replay it and lead to us, to the grand solipsistic conclusion that this whole thing is designed with us in mind, but what a wonderful thing to be starting out in this tremendous new field of endeavor. How fabulous it would be if you had a gift for physics to get a job as an intern with Lawrence Krauss, for example, who's just beginning to unravel as very, very few people have yet dared to do the idea of the alternate and parallel universe. And with each horizon that we reach, we see more bending beautifully towards and away from us, the, the knowledge we have, say, not just of the uh, sentience, but also the cognition 
of animals is all of it incredibly recent, a matter of decades, and enormously rich, and yet again, very much challenging our own claim to primacy or supremacy in, in the biosphere, and rich in every possible kind um, of discovery. I, I suppose I should begin to close now because I've said all I wanted to say for myself, and I will join Richard if I may, you can ask me a question or two with your indulgence, but to say that I'm not going to quit until I absolutely have to, but that I... <coughs> Please. <laughs> well, I wasn't finished. I'm not done. Um, till I absolutely have to. Um, but I so envy those who could, who could glimpse, I only mentioned three or four of the things that have magnetized and charmed and, and gratified me to think about in the recent past and, and how, how, how much I hope that each of you forms some such ambition this evening and carries it forward. In the meantime, we have the same job we always had, to say as, as thinking people and as humans that there are no final solutions, there is no absolute truth, there is no supreme leader, there is no totalitarian solution that says that if you will just give up your freedom of inquiry, if you will just give up, if you will simply abandon your critical faculties, a world of idiotic bliss can be yours. <laughs> you will certainly lose the faculties. Uh, and you may not know as a result that the idiotic bliss is even more idiotic than it looks. But we have to begin by repudiating all such claims. Grand rabbis, chief ayatollahs, infallible popes, the peddlers of surrogate, and mutant quasi-political religion and worship, the dear leader, the great leader. We have no need of any of this. And looking at them and their record and the pathos of their supporters, I realize that it is they who are the grand impostors and my own imposture this evening was mild by comparison. Thank you very much. Thank you. I should have said that the uh, award is a, a beautiful collection of fossils, uh, a nautiloid cephalopod from the Devonian era. Um, so I guess we're to take questions, so questions to either Christopher or me. Um, and shall you sit down, shall I bring the microphone round? As long as I've got the microphone, yeah, it's okay. a lovelier. You can sit together, I can sit. Or I can stand. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Can I draw your time? <laughs> I have no question. I just wish to thank you, sir, for making my life for 35 years a rational life. Thank you very much. I feel like my vows that I acknowledge that I transformed the world. She's a bit much. Thank you. 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 Why in the world can't I have a hero like you? Well, because you shouldn't need or want to have heroes. Every time people say, 
And the, when I'm signing a book, I'm not sure if you can, I say, you know, if I don't want to be on for another, I want to quickly read it. 